This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Hi, guys. Today, we've got a special guest on the podcast. His name is Gary Thomas. So Gary is a best-selling author and an international speaker, and his books have literally sold over 2 million copies worldwide. So he's probably most known for his marriage and relationship books, including Sacred Marriage, which by itself has sold over a million copies, and Cherished, which is on the 100 books every modern Christian man should read list that's on our website. Also, he has a new book out that we spend a lot of our time talking about today called Making Your Marriage a Fortress. So this guy's life statement, if you will, I guess you could call it that, is bringing people closer to Christ and closer to others. And so he spends a lot of time talking about relationships. So we get into his books, Sacred Marriage and Cherish, and, and why those things are so important. But again, we spend most of our time talking about making your marriage a fortress. And also, uh, there was a great quote from there that I got his feedback on. And I loved it. It was, make the situation your enemy instead of your spouse. Uh, we talked about the work of Dr. John Gott. Men. We spent quite a bit of time talking about sex and, and sensuality and trust and all the things uh, inherent in that. And I asked him a few questions that he doesn't ever get asked. And so he was very happy about that, especially afterwards when the interview was done. You know, he was very uh, you know, complimentary of the fact that we got into some areas that are very, very important for men that aren't really gotten into very much. At the end, we talk about manhood inside the church. And to be honest, I think this is the first interview I've done that is just about marriage. So guys, if you're not married, this still applies to you. Because obviously the the model that we get to understand God's love for us or Jesus's love uh, is, you know, how Jesus loved the church is how we're supposed to love our spouse. And Jesus gave up his life for the church, for the people of God. And so I think that it's a very, very important subject matter. I, I certainly don't have enough people on this podcast to talk about it, but Gary Thomas is, is one of those people that is very well versed in this particular area. He's written a lot about it. He's thought a lot about it. So I was so glad that we were able to get him on. But before we get there, I want to remind you about the Upper Room and the King's Council. So this is big time attention to business owners, entrepreneurs, and the soon-to-be entrepreneurs that are listening to this podcast right now, the Upper Room and the King's Council. So the mission of these two organizations is to create wealth and provision for the purpose of establishing God's covenant on earth. So what these organizations do, what these two groups do, is they equip entrepreneurs with tools, systems, and frameworks necessary to discover, develop, and deploy their God-given vision into the marketplace. So specifically, I want to talk about the upper room mastermind. So if you're an existing entrepreneur or a business owner, or you're about to launch in, or you're trying to ramp up and you're looking for a tribe of like-minded, bold kingdom leaders, eager to engage in the battle of business, then the upper room is 100% for you guys. So I don't want you to miss out on this. So what they do is they host virtual and in-person events every month, and they focus on business strategies to increase sustainable revenue for your business while providing ongoing accountability. So this is a very customizable thing to your business. Cause obviously if you're running you know, a uh, flower shop versus running an insurance business is going to be a little bit different what your needs are. So I've actually spoken to their group before. So I have some behind the scenes looks as kind of some of the things that they're doing. And if you want more information on this, go to episode 355 of this podcast. That was my interview with Riley Meek. He is the founder of the King's Council in the upper room. So it's 355 Riley Meek at the King Entrepreneurship and Money. And he made an offer on that episode that I thought was awesome. So if you guys will text upper room to 727-472-3860, you will get an application to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with Riley Meek, who is the founder of the upper room and the King's council. So again, that's upper room. So that's U P P E R R O O M to 727-472-3860 to schedule your one-on-one -on -one with the founder of the upper room and the King's council, Riley Meek guys, you will not want to miss this. It's going to be great value to you. But guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Gary Thomas, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thanks for having me here, Kyle. Okay, so we, we've got a little over an hour with each other today. That that should be enough time for us to fix everybody's marriage listening to this, right? Like the, we should be able to make that happen? Piece of cake. Piece of okay. cake. Okay. That, that's what I heard. I heard every podcast you've been on, there's just like a ripple effect of all these broken people that have been fixed. So we got to keep that going with this particular podcast. But as weird as it is to start out at 30,000 uh, 30, feet and to keep it really, really basic, what led you specifically to become an author, but not just an author, because there's a lot of those, but specifically a Christian nonfiction author? Well, I'll be honest, Cal, although it may make me lose credibility with your listeners, I, I became an author because there's nothing else you would pay me for. Okay. I, I'm a man of extremely limited gifts. I, I'm not mechanical. I don't like numbers. I don't like to be in charge of people. 
I always wanted to be a writer, and God blessed it, and I'm so grateful that I've been able to feed my family through it. But the, the thing that led to marriage was that I'd written a number of books on how we get closer to God, hmm. and yet the one thing that I'd never seen a book on was how marriage and parenting were challenging me spiritually as a man, as a person, like nothing else ever had. I'm not putting down fasting or meditation or spiritual. Th th those have their place. And I don't have to get negative about them at all. But when it comes to facing my insecurities, having to swallow my pride, learning to ask for forgiveness or offer forgiveness, learning to be patient, learning to be gentle <laughs> with a mm -hmm. wife or daughter that seems very sad. I mean, all of those things, marriage and family life, it was like a school of spiritual formation. I, I, I call it the spiritual gymnasium. It's where I would get my spiritual workout. And I'd never seen somebody address marriage from that perspective. It was always, you know, the five principles of Jesus that'll make your marriage easy. I thought, you know, I don't think any marriage is easy all the time. But if we understand the purpose behind the difficulty, instead of running from our marriage, we can embrace it. Just like we go to the gym knowing it's going to make us sore. It's going to make us sweat. It's going to make us smelly. It's going to make us tired. But we're thinking, but you know what? If I spend an hour in there, I can come out stronger, faster, healthier. Same thing with marriage. I, if I can come out more like Christ, if I can be more humble, if I can be more serving, more sacrificial, then at least I see the purpose behind the difficulty. So let's talk about that difficulty a little bit. And don't worry, we'll get to all the books, guys. Chill out, chill your beans. But part of the difficulty, I think, is because I know that if I'm training myself or training someone else and they want to get stronger legs by chance, well, in order to do that, they need to put a barbell across their shoulders, squat down a bunch of times, and then come back up, right? That, right. That's what they need to do. There is a 0% chance if they do that consistently that their legs will not get stronger, right? right. But with marriage, it's not like that at all because there technically is no formula. And I'm going to force you to give me some answers that are very formulaic at some point in this podcast. But that's the thing that I think most guys are scared of is they're like, well, I can do all the stuff you're supposed to do. I can check every single one of the boxes. My wife could still hate me. Like I, I could still be a terrible person. I can still mess up. We could still have a terrible marriage. And I guess that's, that's kind of the struggle for, especially the guys that listen to this show. Well, there, there's a fascinating verse in the book of James. James 3.2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Now, some of your listeners may not know that James grew up with Jesus. Protestants believe he was his brother. Of course, didn't have the same father. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Roman Catholics would say he was a cousin. The key thing is that they grew up together in childhood. James knew what moral perfection was because he grew up with it. Now, imagine sibling rivalry when you have a brother that's literally perfect. I mean, how frustrating that is. And so it's significant. The early church knew this. He didn't have to remind the people reading his letters who he was. They all knew. It. They were in awe. Here's a man who grew up with Jesus. And yet he says, we all stumble in many ways. And it's sort of like a weekend hacker that thinks, you know, I'm, I've, I've got golf down pat. And then he does a round with Tiger Woods and says, oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're playing a different game than I am. Or some guy that works out a little bit and he's with a professional MMA guy and goes, okay, well, I, I, I wouldn't last 30 seconds in there. Mm -hmm. and, and James had that spiritually where he had been with the very best. I said, can we be beyond? If, if we're not comparing ourselves left or right, I'm not looking for the worst husband in the church. I, I'm not even looking at the best husband in the church. I'm, I'm comparing myself to Jesus. Because if you compare yourself to Jesus as I did, the best of us on our best day, we stumble in many ways. And I think if we men would just start with that, Kyle, I'm not there yet. That There's more I can do. I've got a couple friends that are you know, PGA Tour golfers. They have more coaches than anybody I've ever met. Not because they're bad golfers, but because they have to be among the very best to keep earning money. So they have the food coach, they have the strength and conditioning coach, they have the swing coach, they have the putting. I mean, it's amazing how many people they, they hire. And so if we would just have this attitude that, you know what, I'm not going to compare myself to this husband or that husband. C compared to Jesus, I, I got a lot of room to grow. 
And, and so then when we see these issues in our marriage, it's not about does it work to change. It's I'm, I'm doing it because God, God wants me to be the person I can be. Just like when you're training a guy, you just want him to be what he can be. We, we all have certain limits, how strong you can be, how fast you can be, how quick you can be. But you want to be operating at your very best level. And so it's learning to say, okay, how can I use marriage to reach that level? Even though it will feel like a spiritual workout, how can I figure out what it means to love this woman? Maybe she's fearful. Maybe she's overbearing. Maybe she's insecure. Maybe she's sensitive. Maybe she's too sarcastic and hard. Whatever it is, how do I learn to grow in love by learning to love this particular woman that I'm married to? When it's kind of like becoming an expert, uh, some people would say becoming an expert in your spouse. I say becoming yeah. a black belt in your spouse because I've been training yeah. jujitsu for a while. And you people that train jujitsu know how unbelievably hard it is. And I know black belts that are fine with doing the stuff that they did on the first week or two that they were a white belt because they know you have to continually sharpen the sword. And I know plenty of people that are brown belts or black belts in jujitsu that are white belts or blue belts in life. And, and that's not really a position that you want to be in. Now, probably the the most notable book that you've written on the subject of marriage is a book called Sacred Marriage. I think you've sold a, a few copies of that to date. How many copies have you sold? I'm going to make you brag on yourself. Say it. Say it. Uh I think we're about 1.2 million. Don't 1. pretend 1 million, like you didn't know like the exact answer. You knew the exact. Oh, I think it's <laughs> oh shucks, 1.2 million. So I guess people really engaged with that content, and you don't get to 1.2 million in the modern day of publishing without people sharing it around, buying a case of it, and giving it out to people at their church or at their office or something like that. So what? I guess you could tell us, you know, what in the hell the book's actually about. But then beyond that. Why? Why is that the book? Because it's not the only marriage book you've gotten, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, below your belt. Now we'll we'll kind of get into those some other ones here in a second. Why was that the one that took off to the moon? Well, first it's had time. It was first published in the year two thousand. But but you're right. Ninety five percent of books sell five thousand copies or less. So, but I, I think here, here's what was happening, Kyle. I was writing in the Christian market where I felt like books weren't being honest about marriage. To sell books, they were saying. Here are the five principles of Jesus and your marriage is easy. These are the six biblical principles. You follow these things through it. You know why? Because John I, I Maxwell ruined everything. John Maxwell ruined everything. He wrote 74 books with numbers in front of it, and now everyone's just like rinsing and repeating. <laughs> Sorry, I just got to get mad at John. Uh, John, uh, I literally just forgot his name because I got so mad at him again. But go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. And, and, and so then I, I came through and I said, look, I think even the best of marriages will have difficult times. And people were kind of surprised, like, we're admitting the difficulty. And I said, here's why, I don't here's why I'm not afraid of mentioning the difficulty. The best things in life are difficult. Becoming a black belt in jiu-jitsu is, is extremely difficult. Otherwise, there would be no satisfaction in getting there. Right. Starting a business these days, when you got governmental regulation, when you have competitors, when you have people trying to steal your customers, assault your revenue, right? that's not easy to do. Learning to master an instrument, all of these things – you know, the best athletes, I just talked about the PGA Tour golfers, where they just they have to address everything these days. Why do we think marriage should be easy? Is, isn't a lot of the glory of it that, okay, it's difficult, but that makes me want to step up. Instead of saying, well, if it's difficult, I won't have anything to do with it. Well, then you're just a different kind of guy for me. I mean, if you're always taking the easy way out, then I don't think you like my books. And I don't, I don't think we have a lot in common. Um, <laughs> and so I was willing to say, I think they're difficult. And what is that difficulty? That through our marriage, we can become more like Christ. And I, I follow Jesus who said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When he says first, in the Greek, that's present tense. That means continually keep on seeking for above everything else, his righteousness. And, and so it's, I'm a big fan of the Tour de France. Uh, I, I don't know if a lot of people listening like that, but I, I've read a lot of biographies of the winning bikers. And I think of Geraint Thomas, uh, who won one year, and he talked about how uh, to be a top biker, where you're going over Alp d'Huez, these are freaks of nature, because they have to have quadriceps like an NFL lineman mm -hmm. and arms like a chess player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want yes. any extra weight. And, and so they they really have to keep their weight down. If you're pedaling over Alp d'Huez, I mean, you don't want any extra weight at all. And he talked about on the I obviously he goes, yeah, bikers can't have ice creams. He goes, it's just, it's, it's not. And, and you think he's given up a lot, but if you could have seen his face when he was in the yellow jersey and he knew he'd won 
the Tour de France a couple of years ago, the, the biggest race in the world for bikers. He wasn't thinking about the ice creams he gave up. He wasn't thinking about the times in the rain that he was going up the mountain. He, wasn't, he was just thinking, okay, it, 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 you could see it on his face. And, and I think the same thing, if we want to seek first his righteousness, we recognize, yeah, there are things I'm giving up, but this is better. And, and it's just, l- let me even make this practical. I, I know a guy in, in, in working on this book, interviewed a lot of guys. One guy had a sexual addiction. He had been a player and not just in real life, but online, really got messed up with porn and he was in prison. And he, he went into recovery and he had to work it hard. He was going to 12-step groups. He was you know, making phone calls. He was going to counseling. He got it done. Like five years into recovery, he was driving with his kids. One of his kids said, hey, daddy, can I, can I see your iPad? I need to look something up. And he said, sure. And he handed it over. And he realized five years before, he would have been terrified. He would have never let his wife or kids see his iPad. Something might come up. Maybe he forgot to erase something. Maybe they'll see a history of something. And, and the joy he felt I don't have to have secrets with my kids. I'm not ashamed of what my kids might find. I'm not afraid of my wife knowing my password. She can see everything I have. There was a new peace. There was a joy. There was a contentment. He had to work really hard to get free. But now that he was, he had a new relationship with his wife. He had new freedom with his kids. And he would say it, it was worth it. So was, was getting sober difficult? Yeah. Was it worth it when he reached the mountaintop? without question. And I, I just think the same thing is true of marriage in so many areas. I was such a selfish person when I got married. And now I think one of my greatest joys is being able to do practical things for my wife. Uh, I just, I, I enjoy it. I like being that person more than fuming over the fact that she didn't do this and I wanted her to do that. I think the other thing about it as well is most people in general, whether they're authors or managers or whatever, they're afraid of pushing people. Like they really are afraid of pushing people because they're like, especially kind of like this mega church thing, which I won't make you make any comments about that because I'm sure they pay you good money to come and speak to their flocks. But whenever you don't push people on culturally important issues, we don't push people on, on what's exactly being said in scripture and in what context and how that applies to them in their life. What you're going to get is a bunch of people that are confused. And then you might even get people that think they're saved that aren't because you're like, oh yeah, just kind of be a good person and you know uh, believe that Jesus was a really nice guy and never got angry and always kiss people on the tips of their noses and and you'll be fine. Like and that's just kind of the deal. So I think that's part of the reason why sacred marriage uh, was so successful is because it was pushing people and people like to be challenged as you talked about. But you have another book. You have several, but uh, the other one I did want to make note of is a book called Cherish. So we have a book list on our website called The 100 Books Every Modern Christian Man Should Read. There's a bunch of different categories. There's leadership. There's business, philosophy, theology, whatever. But we do have a marriage category and Cherish is on there because I think mm. it's better than the other ones. But, you know, you may differ. You might have a favorite of your own if you had to pick a favorite kid. But I guess the nexus of that book, which is very digestible and very easy to relate to, is how that one word, Cherish, yeah. can change how someone operates in a marriage. Now, typically... I'm not big on the whole self helpy like, this is your word, and we're going to focus on this word, and everything's going to be magical, and it's going to be great. But this is my one exception, that if you focus on that one word, not love, because love's kind of squishy, and people don't really know what it means. Cherish. We know what that means. Yeah. When you're cherishing a duckling, or you're, you're cherishing you know, some project that you get to work on, when you're cherishing a person, it makes a big difference. So I don't even have a question for you, because I didn't want to sell you short on my favorite book of yours. But tell me about Cherish. Where did that come from? Why is Cherish, the word and the action, so important? Well, the word was hiding in plain sight. I mean, it's in most modern vows. I promise to love and to cherish until death mm-hmm. do us part. After I said that, I forgot about the words for probably 25 years. I mean, I focused on love. You think of marriage, you think of love, and I think love is important. Sacrifice, service, commitment, loyalty, hanging in, that, that's good. But I just felt challenged one time that God was saying, you promised to cherish your wife, my daughter, God speaking. me. I want you to figure out what that means. I want you to put it into practice. And God, I thought I had a decent marriage, but here's what it did for me. I remember I've, I've been a distance runner, and I remember when I was, no, I don't remember, but I've read about it. When Roger Bannister mm-hmm. broke the four minute barrier in the mile. And what a lot of people don't realize was within months, two other people had. Right. Before that, people thought it wasn't possible that physiologically a human being couldn't go that fast. Once he said, This is the new bar, all of a sudden everybody's going under it. It happens with world records all the time. And for me, it was setting a new bar in my marriage. 
I'm going to be faithful to my, I'm not going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to be loyal. I'm going to hang in there. Cherishing was a whole new bar. Cherishing isn't about my obligations. It's focusing on the excellence and the beauty of my spouse so that my wife feels cherished. For instance, when I'm listening to her, it's not just listening to her to be polite. It's it's what, listening to her with my eyes as well as my ears so that she knows I'm listening. So she feels like what she's saying is important. Uh, and, and and here's the thing. A- after the book came out, I was speaking at a, sorry, Kyle, but a mega church. I had a lot of people there. I knew it. I knew it. It's fine. And, and they had planned it for a long time, and I was really sick. And I don't get sick very often. I mean, I, I can go years without having a real serious sickness. But this was one night where I had the flu. I was just getting through the thing, and it, it was terrible. But I had a fever from the flu, and then it broke that night. I'm in the hotel room with my wife. And you know how when the fever breaks and you start to get cold, and I'm kind of shivering a little bit. Mm-hmm. And my my wife starts to put her arms around me. I'm like, honey, watch out. Go, oh, this is awful. You really don't want to catch this. And she said, well, aren't you cold? I said, yes. And she pulls me closer and says, I got to get you warm. Now, guys, I just want to ask you, being cherished is so unusual in this world. When wives are often taken for granted by their kids or resented by the kids, or they become invisible to others as they get older, all of these things that, that really can hurt. But if they have a guy who cherishes them, what do you think a wife will do for a guy that cherishes her? In my experience, whatever she has to do for his well, for his welfare. She doesn't want to lose that. I think it's just a different dynamic in marriage. I, I love you. I don't put love and cherish as, as any. They're compliments. Cherish without love won't have the substance to last. But love without cherish can start to feel like a duty and a discipline while you're there because you promise to and you can't go. And that's not satisfying either. I think the ultimate marriage is when you love and cherish as we promised to do, or at least most of us did on the day we got married. When I think most of us think about the paradigm, if we think about our relationship outside of just a single word being love, we think of the other word being like. Not, I mean, I think there's even a movie out there. It's like, I don't just love you. I like you. And like, that's supposed to be like this big, deep thing. And I remember the first time I heard it, it's like, that's pretty good. Second time I heard it, I'm like, mm, probably not. But the, if it was love and cherish, like that makes a, a much bigger difference. And again, to anyone that was offended by my mega church com- comment, I think it's funny. It's not always funny to you, but not every <laughs> mega church is bad. Still book Gary to come and speak to your people. He didn't say it. I did. But l- let's talk a little bit about the new book. So you did uh, uh, write a new book and I'm so thankful that you sent it to me a little early so I could check it out. It's called Making Your Marriage a Fortress. Um, it's a fantastic early read. I'll read the sub- subtitle, Strengthening Your Marriage to Withstand Life's Storms. And so the book has a whole bunch of different stories of real people that you're aware of that you, you know, maybe have a relationship with and it kind of personalizes some of the overall wisdom that you're putting into a book like this. But very briefly, because we'll dig into the actual meat of the book here in a second. What is this specific book, Making Your Marriage a Fortress, about? And what do you hope for readers to get out of it? And and I guess you could separate it off. What do you hope to get, get, you know, Gary Thomas readers to get out of this book and maybe people that have never read your work before? Yeah. The premise, making your marriage a fortress, is that your marriage needs to be a fortress. The time's going to come when the storm hits your house and it hits it hard. I opened the book by talking about we moved to Houston, Texas from the Pacific Northwest. So every fall they would have the hurricane warnings, get get your kid out, get ready, be prepared. And I, I kind of took it seriously. It sounded terrifying to be in a hurricane. But after five or six years, you're like, yeah. It's white noise. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, sure, whatever. And then one year they said Harvey was coming to town. And I was just like, again, yeah, we've heard it before. They just make a big deal. That. And a friend of mine called and said, Gary, I've seen the weather data. This, this is real. You need to get in town. You need to get ready. Well, I didn't have time to get ready. So we're in our house and it hits. And over three days, it dumps over 55 inches of rain. It felt like the biblical flood. It was just crazy. And all I had, as I saw the water creeping up our property, covering the grass, coming up, <laughs> this is so pathetic. All I had was blue painter's tape and cardboard, and I'm trying to plug everything in the house of the water. And, and you know, it's, it's a yeah. joke. It, it, it's like sending in a 90-pound man to go into a heavyweight MMA fight. I mean, there's just no chance. Now, by God's mercy, the water never got into our house because we were in a higher part of Houston. It, it got close, but it never did actually flood. But I realized 
trying to prepare for the storm after it's hit it's it's just it's a fool's errand. You can't mm-hmm. get ready. It's like you don't prepare for a fight the day before the fight. You've got months getting into shape, building your quickness, building your endurance, building your strength. And so often with marriage, we just kind of take our marriage for granted. And if if the emotional or spiritual or financial climate is like Santa Barbara, where it's perfect weather every day, fine. You can get by with being a little estranged from your wife or having a little addiction or two on the side. and It's not a big deal. But when the storm hits, and it will in this fallen world, will your marriage be a refuge or will it become part of the problem? Because if the storm hits and it takes your marriage with you, now it becomes the biggest problem. You know, maybe you're getting a divorce. Now maybe you have to find another house. You're splitting your income in two. You're trying to figure out how do I stay connected with these kids that I can only see every other weekend. And and so it's just recognizing we live in a world with a lot of storms. You may not be facing one right now, but these are stories of couples that have had some of the worst hits imaginable. Um, You know, health issues, a child dying, financial issues or whatnot. Uh, and, And how did their marriage succeed? Now, can I give an example of one couple that I think just... Sure, yeah. Um Daryl was a weightlifter before he got married. Serious. He could bench press 400 pounds, which your listeners know. I mean, they're into this. That, that's an NFL lineman is happy to claim 400 pounds for a bench press. That's pretty good. He always wanted to be strong. And his wife married him because he was strong. She had a dysfunctional childhood. She felt safe. She felt secure. So he married her because he wanted to take care of her. She married him because she wanted him to be strong, take care of her. Three years after they were married, he started having some vision issues. And they had a foot that was dragging. And he goes to the doctor and he says, you've got MS. So what do you do for your marriage when the reason you got married doesn't hold true anymore? For the rest of your life, (laughs) You're not going to be able to be that strong person for her. He was, you know, he stayed off going to a walker as long as he could, then a wheelchair. Now he's in a scooter. He hasn't been able to carry in the groceries for his wife, Stacy, for for decades. So how does that couple still stay together? And these are the sort of, I've said what I could say about marriage, Kyle, and other books. What makes this book different for me is I just went to couples, wise couples, who had gone through the, I said, what did you learn? What can you teach us? I mean, th- this would so pull so many cu- couples apart where the wife would be resentful. I didn't marry a man to live in a scooter. And he goes, I want to do this for my wife and I can't. Where Daryl blew me away. He talked about getting ready for bed at night. And remember, this is a guy who prided himself on being a weightlifter. He was strong. He was fit. And now he's in a scooter. He goes up to his bed and he can use his arms better than his legs. So he can get his body into the bed but he can't move his legs over. His wife has to come in and, and move his legs over. He's pretty advanced in it. And, and he said, you know, some nights I'm just thinking, why don't I just have her do everything? I'm, I, I, can't, I can't take care of myself. And then he said to me, and this, this changed my life, Kyle. This has become one of those, those life lessons that I never want to forget. He said, Gary, when I look at my physical body, I maybe can do 20% of what I used to do at my peak. But I'm committed to doing 100% of that 20%. So if I can still lift my arm, my my body up there, I'm going to do it. Even if I can't get my legs over, I'm not going to just give in. I want to do 100% of the 20% that I can do. And and I've used that in marital counseling. I know a guy that went through um, prostate cancer. They removed his prostate. It made sexual intimacy a whole different challenge. And it's so easy for a couple to say, okay. If we can't do everything, we're not going to do anything. And they just let the whole sexual element die. But their attitude might be, you know what? I'm going to do 100% of the 20%. I can still do this for her. We can still hold each other. We can still do this. We can still try that. They want to do everything that they can do that they're allowed to do. And so facing this challenge has brought them closer together. Daryl's attitude is, look, I'm so grateful for Stacy, and I have opportunities to be grateful for her a hundred times a day. Instead of being bitter about being in this chair, I'm thankful about having a wife who's loving me so well in the midst of me being in this chair. And those are the kind of stories where, you know, I, I just can't even imagine living their lives and their faith humbles me and inspires me. And I just couldn't wait to get their stories out there. 
Yeah. And that story itself, uh, you know, that's going to ring true for a lot of guys in my audience. And yeah, I literally had this thought today because uh, I was at a funeral yesterday and I had this thought today. I was like, man, my physicality is such a big part of who I am as a person. That's probably where God's going to test me. And I just moved on making my sandwich <laughs> or moved on with my day. And it's just like, yeah, but if that were to happen, it would like irrevo irrevocably change my life and my outlook and how I do things and my level of bitterness and whatever. And so you, you, you gave a, a story, which is really, really nice, but I'm, I'm a little bit, I don't know if you can tell I'm drawn to more of the gritty stuff. I'm drawn to the stuff that maybe isn't so nice and, and clean and, and has a happy ending. And there was one line in your book that I don't know, maybe in a throwaway line to you, but maybe this is the, the line in the book that has resonated with me the most, but it's not a, even a quote from you. It's a quote that you can yeah, attribute to someone else that you heard say this before, but it's make the situation your enemy yeah. instead of your spouse. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's yes. the big one. Right, because I'm a very competitive guy. You're talking to a bunch of competitive people. You seem to be a competitive person. And when it's another person on the other side of the equation, it's very easy to make that person the enemy and to make sure you can always be on the better end of whatever it is, the fight or the situation. You want to make sure you're on the better end of it because you're so competitive, because you're, you're making them the enemy. So talk to me a little bit more about that, because again, that was, that was the sticky thing. There's a lot of sticky things in this book, but that was really sticky. It was just like, oh. I think I suck at that, like making the situation your enemy and not your spouse. Go for it. I've I've liked to read a lot of military history. I've never been in the military, but it just tries men's courage and and fortitude in decision making. Five minutes in combat could be five decades in civilian life. And one of the things that they would teach in, in Vietnam is when they were ambushed or something, they would form a circle. And you made sure that circle didn't get penetrated. Because if you know you got your buddies and you're left or right behind you, you don't worry about what's happening left or right or behind you. You're just making sure my part of the circle doesn't get penetrated because once it happens one time, we're wiped out. And I think if guys had that attitude about their marriage, finances hit, health hits, kid crisis, something like that, or grief crisis, it's like, okay, my wife and I are going to form this circle. What matters most is our emotional connection. More than we solve this problem, I've got you on a gritty story in there, a couple that has been facing financial challenges for over a decade. They gave themselves into poverty. How do you like that? People have the yeah. prosperity gospel, but for them, it was almost the opposite. But I mean, put that aside. You're saying, we're not going to let this problem become between the two of us because so often what happens is the problem hits and you resent your spouse. Well, why can't she respond this way? Or she'll say, well, why didn't he do better? Why didn't he foresee this? Or well, how come he couldn't have avoided this? And you hate the situation you're in. And it's okay to hate the situation. When I talk to a couple that lost their only child, I don't expect them to ever not hate that day when they got the phone call, their only child was gone. But how do you make that problem? How do you resent that problem instead of your spouse? Because if you let the problem separate you from your spouse, where the circle is penetrated, then at that point, you've got a bigger problem. Now your marriage is going to collapse with it. And what these couples found is that their marriage grew through something they hated. They still, none of them would go back and say, man, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful for this trial. But it was, but because of this trial, we have a better marriage. And I'd rather have a better marriage than an easy life where we weren't as emotionally connected. When I think a lot of people, they say they want the easy path. I remember when Jordan Peterson talked about this, where people, their entire working life was built on, okay, one of these days, I'm just gonna be able to sit on a beach and drink pina coladas and just sit there all day. And then he's like, okay, well, after two weeks is up, then what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. That's going to get really stale after a while, waking up drunk in the sand. Like that's, that's probably not a life that you want. Like we, we need that push. And a lot of people don't realize like there was work in the garden before sin entered right? God gave us work beforehand. It wasn't, work wasn't the result, the punishment for sin. It was the, the, the backing and the scaffolding under that work that was tainted when, exactly. when Eve ate the apple. So, you know, but look, we're not going to get into Genesis here because I want to make sure we continue going through some of the stuff in the book. Fantastic book, Making Your Marriage a Fortress. So in the book, you address the work of a guy named Dr. John Gottman, who I'd not heard of before, but he spent a lot of time talking about this male tendency to withdraw in relationships. I know breaking news. A lot of people uh, maybe never heard this before that men like to emotionally withdraw in relationships, but you use the term or you used his term stonewallers. Yes. Okay. That's very different than, oh, I'm withdrawing or I'm, you know, I'm a introspective male. So I'm gonna go over here in my shop and whittle and then, you know, deal with my feelings that way. Give us a little bit more on that because, you know, obviously you guys got to get the book to get the, the full uh, accounting of what Dr. John Gottman was talking about there. Yeah. But why is uh, talking about stonewallers so important for men to understand? 
Yeah, well, Dr. Gottman's from the University of Washington, really considered one of the experts in the academic field for relationships and whatnot. He can meet with a couple and 10 minutes kind of tell you with 90% accuracy if they're going to get a divorce or not. And he would call stonewalling one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's a biblical term of these are one of the four things that are really going to bring your marriage down. Stonewalling is when you decide you're just not going to deal with an issue, that you get flooded, um, you get frustrated, and you say, well, let's just we're just going to pretend it's not going to affect anything. And, and, and it would be sort of like somebody waking up and feeling a lump on their throat. So I'm not going to go to the doctor because if the doctor doesn't tell me it's cancer, it can't hurt me, right? <laughs> when the reverse is true, yeah. it's going to spread. If you don't treat it unaddressed, it's going to get worse. And that's what happens with stonewalling. There's an issue in your marriage. Ignoring it is not going to make it go away. It's going to get worse. It's going to fester. It's going to create bitterness. It's going to create resentment. It's going to become a bigger part of the problem. Now, I love what you said. There's a difference between processing and stonewalling. If you get frustrated and you want to go out and pound a heavy bag down in the basement, you want to go out and, and ride your motorcycle fast for a little while, fine, go ahead. Do that, but then come back and say, okay, how do we get reconnected? How do I understand where you're coming from? How can I listen in such a way that I get why we don't see things the same way? It's the work of marriage. To not do that is to spiritually divorce your wife. And if you keep spiritually divorcing your wife, eventually you're going to legally divorce your wife because nobody wants to be in a lonely marriage for the rest of their lives. When a lot of times you talk about this book, I didn't ask you about it, but you talk about just the the danger of marital uh, marital disconnection, right? That's yes. kind of like a major theme, especially early in the book. It's just marital disconnection overall. But guys, I waited until about a half hour into this interview before we talked about what all of y'all are hoping I ask him about. And that's the S word. We're going to talk about sex, Gary. I know you don't always talk about sex or you talk about it too much, whatever people are into, but there's a quote from the book that'll ease us in to this subject matter. And then we're going to hit it home. Uh, so let's go to this quote from the book here. This is exactly the point that divides so many couples. The husband wants more physical intimacy. The wife wants more emotional connection. And what happens is that because the wife feels cheated emotionally, she pulls back from the husband physically. And because the husband feels cheated physically, he pulls back emotionally and the problem keeps getting worse. Now, there's been a lot of breaking news in this podcast interview so far. That might be breaking news as well. Have you guys ever heard of such a thing? Have you ever experienced <laughs> such a thing? I'm assuming if you haven't experienced it directly, there is a brother in your life, someone in your foxhole that is going through that exact same thing. And it's a cycle that people can't get out of, Gary. Like it is of all the cycles within marriage that I'm aware of not being a professional at this. That's the one where it's like, yep, that makes the most amount of sense. How do we get out of it? No freaking idea. So tell us how we get out of it. Okay. There, there are a couple things. If we can spend a little bit of time on it, uh, it might be worthwhile. First, if I look at this from a biblical perspective, Paul says the stronger gives way to the weaker all the time. He said, you know what? If you're really a more mature believer, you're a stronger believer, then instead of saying what to the weaker, why can't you step up? I, in those situations, I say somebody's got to act like a Christian. If your wife needs to be emotionally connected to you, get emotionally connected without expectations. Just say, okay, I've got to step up. I'm the guy. I'm the man in this relationship. I've got to do what I have to do to help reconnect. And, and I'm telling you, guys, Kyle, if, if guys would take that step, I'll never forget. My wife and I, um, I, I wrote a book for wives called Loving Him Well. And a group of women at a church were reviewing it. They had me come in. And then one of them asked the question, Gary, how come we read 10 books like this before our husbands will read one. Another wife said, I gave my husband the best marriage book out there and I'm checking the bookmark and it hasn't moved. Yeah. Which means, guys, if your wife is giving you a book, at least move the bookmark. They are checking and it really ticks them off. But if the guy would initiate, if the guy would bring that book home, you mentioned chair, say try that, or this making your marriage a fortress and say, honey, look, you know what? I, I've been busy and I've been distracted. I'm sorry. You've carried this more than I have. Hey, I want to go through this together. I want us to talk or I want us to go to the marriage conference instead of making it like a big deal. I, I can't even describe to the guys what would be going through their wives' minds if the wife felt like I'm not alone in doing this. And it's not a guarantee 
But so often when we're addressing those other areas of the relationship, they just naturally warm up. Now, depending on if there's been years of hurt and things to work through, it might not take a while. One guy I talked to, he had to change his attitude for 11 months before his wife came on because they'd been married 15 or 20 years. A lot had been built up and she didn't believe it at first. And after 11 months, she was just praying and she says, okay, I'm being a jerk now. He's proven himself. He's doing it. He's not getting anything out of it. I'm not changing. So so it, it, it might take a while, but I, I think we do first, okay, what is it that helps my wife want to desire that sexual relationship? Is there something I'm not doing, i.e. not connecting with her emotionally, not connecting with her spiritually, not making sure that her pleasure is more important than mine? I mean, and then is there something I am doing that isn't as, as helpful? Uh, one of the things I went through with the two couples here that was really helpful for guys to know, there's two different kinds of desire sexually. And this doesn't mean men or women. Women can not be the higher desire, but they call it spontaneous desire or responsive desire. One, one might call it um, initiating desire, receptive desire. It means the same thing, basically, that for some of us, if, if, if our wife takes off her shirt, we're, we're ready to have sex. She says, you want to have sex? Yeah, I'm ready to have sex. I mean, we don't need something to get us in the mood. It's just if, if we have a willing wife, we're in the mood. That's spontaneous. You don't need to get there. Responsive desire means you actually kind of have to let yourself be touched and caressed before your brain kicks into gear and you really want this. And you talk to some with spontaneous desire or receptive desire where they have a great time. They might even be married to a spouse who's very generous and thoughtful in bed. And afterwards they say, why don't we do this every day? But then they just don't want it again until it starts to happen. And so they have to learn, okay, if I just let what I feel like initially motivate me, I'm, I'm never going to really want to have sex. And so you can't really change that, but you can become aware of it. And so I would say if you're the spontaneous, don't resent your spouse. Your spouse has the brain that she has. It's not that there's any defect with it. It's just the way she's connected. But realize that, that there are things you're going to have to do and, and learn and understand for her want to, to receive sexual contact or her to in, enjoy it. Um, and, and so it's, it's learning to understand each other. I, I wrote another book called Married Sex. I did it with a female therapist so that we could have both the male and female perspective. And I think one of the greatest things that we have to help couples overcome is that guys approach their wives like their guys. Wives often approach their husbands like they're women. We're not. We think about sex differently. We experience sex differently. Our brains are wired differently. Our bodies are wired differently. And for sex to be desired, we've got to put our wife's pleasure right up there. And we also have to recognize we're, she's very different. What makes her feel receptive? What helps her get going? And there are a lot of steps you can do to help with that. And guys, we obviously don't have enough time to go into all that detail. You've talked about a lot in your book. You mentioned another one there, and obviously you spend some time in making your marriage a fortress going into that. But I'm going to force you to answer a question, and you're not allowed to say it depends, okay? And you're not even allowed to say something that sounds like it depends. And you know exactly where I'm going, Gary, because I got friends that are relationship counselors. One of them is a good buddy of mine, Donnie Van Curen. He helps uh, run our Sunday school, and I've asked him this question before, and I've asked some of his friends questions before, and they won't answer it. And I got to get an answer, okay? And that question that I need an answer to, Gary, is how often should a healthy married couple be having sex? Well, Go. it depends. <laughs> Come on, Gary. You knew that was going to happen. Come on. I, I can tell you, look, I've seen a number of different studies. The best study I can find um, is that it's about 55 to 60 times a year. Uh, what that means is basically once a week and maybe you have a holiday away where you have a special couple times or whatnot. But but that's that's about what's average. Now, if for newlyweds, it's often much higher than that. For younger couples, uh, when you have kids and whatnot, things are different. Um, I think in general, if there aren't, it's a difference if, if there's trauma that, right. that a, a wife is working through, if there's abuse, if, if going through grief giving birth, health issues or whatnot, those things that come, P putting all that aside, that it's not a physical issue, um, that if it's just about creating interest, I think if a couple 
isn't being intimate once a week or so. Uh, I, I think they're not serving their marriage as well as they could. Uh, I, I, I do think it starts to become dangerous because sex is like exercising, when, use it or lose it. You know, if you work out every day, you just don't even think about it. And it's not right. hard for the inertia. Or, you, you know, you maybe take a day or two off. It's not a big deal. But then you go two weeks without mm -hmm. working out, and all of a sudden, it just is harder to get started. Our brains are just like that with sex. And so if we let it start to die, um, it, it can really be a lot harder to bring it back. And so there are different things you can do. Some couples have scheduled sex, which seems terrible to others. Uh, I, here's, I think, one of the advantages. One of the things I wrote about in, in Married Sex, it's really helpful, and it's exemplified in the Song of Songs. Okay, so this is biblical, right? It's called simmering. Sex therapists talk about this now, the practice of simmering, where if you are responsive desire, you realize, okay, it's hard to go from ice cold to red hot. Because I don't when you're ice cold, you don't red hot might not sound good. But if you're warm, mm -hmm. it's a whole lot easier. And so if you know there's gonna be sex that day, you're thinking, what can I talk about? And it's amazing the Song of Songs, how the husband graphically meditates on the loveliest parts of his wife's body. He's mesmerized by her eyes. He's mesmerized by her hair, her breasts, her legs. He just goes down, her neck, all of it. And then there's a whole passage where the wife does it of the husband. And she thinks about his arms and she thinks about his chest and, and his legs and, and all of that. Not only is that not discouraged, it's biblically prescribed. If it's your spouse and it helps you get in the mood and it helps your spouse get in the mood, Think wonderful sexual thoughts about your spouse. What's their most desirable part? And, and get ready to get going. That simmering, modern sex therapists would say it's a really wise thing to do. And the Bible prescribed it. Well, that book was written 3,000 years ago. So it's a, it's a long time medicine to, to do that. Well, there's another quote from the book. It's sexuality divorced from sensuality yes. is a serious red flag. And yeah. I think that that plays into the conversation that we're having right now because I'll put it this way, because there are some women that are very physically attracted to the male form. And then there are women that could really give a care less. They don't care if you've got rippling muscles on the back of your arm. They don't even know what they're called. Like they, they don't care about the, the V or whatever things right. going on, on the bottom of really in shape guys abs. And like, they don't care. But then there are guys that have that in their brain. They're like, oh, women really care about this. I need to be a really strong chimp so that, you know, all the other chimps want to want to be with me and those types of things. But then it becomes a whole lot more about sexuality and not about sensuality. But I think sensuality is really hard for, I don't think, I know sensuality is really hard for a lot of people. Gary, considering the conversations I've had with men, which is not, it pales in comparison to the conversations that you've had, but that's a hard nut to crack, forgive the pun, I think, um, about the sexuality <laughs> and yeah. sensuality and how yeah. uh, there are people and I've used this phrase before when I've talked to couples that have been struggling with this, but it's like, you know, vaginal masturbation. They're, they're using their wife as a dumpster for their seed mm -hmm. and there's nothing else to it. And gosh, how long do you have to do that before it's almost impossible to come back to where there's any sensuality? So again, I don't really have a, a question there. I just wanted to bring that quote up. So, so give yeah. us a little bit more on sexuality diverse from sensuality. Well, here's where the quote came from. It was a couple where the wife had been unfaithful. And the guy's taking her back, and he talked about how there are different levels of intimacy. There's sexual intimacy, spiritual intimacy, emotional intimacy. He talks about that. And he said, you know, to be honest, Gary, our sexual intimacy didn't really take a hit. He goes, but it was a different kind of sex. We were having athletic sex. Hmm. I was getting off. She was getting off. We would say we were physically satisfied, but there was no emotional connection. It wasn't until they got through honesty and healing that they started to have a sensuous experience. And if there's one thing I could say, particularly to help younger men really enjoy greater sexual intimacy, is that how explicit can you get on this show? Oh, as explicit as you want. Okay, I, don't, okay. I don't edit anything. Let's go. Okay. Let me just put it. Penis and vagina intercourse is what's how we usually think of sex is, is but just 10% of the experience. There are so many other things that couples can do to sensuously enjoy each other. I've got a chapter in Married Sex. I know we weren't supposed to really get into this book, but just about how all the five senses in the Song of Songs are celebrated on how bringing smell in, 
mm-hmm. and hearing. And, and, and guys know this. Wives can use their voices as instruments. If the wife is laughing or panting or moaning or urgent or begging, I mean, those are five different sexual experiences right. just with, with their voice. Sight is a big thing for guys. Smell, um, all, all of the senses so that you're creating this banquet experience. And this is where working with a female therapist really helped me because I'd never thought of this connection. You know, you go to a benefit and you go to a benefit usually because your wife asks you to go to a benefit. I don't know guys who usually want to go to a benefit dinner, but she talked about how they, they hit all five senses. You walk in and the room smells a certain way and you've got all of the decorations out and they've got the good food and they've got things for you to taste and they got things for you to hear, good music in the background. She goes, make sex this, this benefit banquet type of experience where it's not just about pound, 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 but it becomes this sensual experience. The one sexual act that incorporates all five senses hearing, taste, touch, sound, and smell is when you kiss your spouse with your eyes wide open. You're looking into her eyes. You can smell, you can taste, you can touch, you can feel all of that things. That's sensuality. And that's what often isn't happened. Uh, You know, sometimes you'll hear prostitutes say they'll do anything but kiss. There's there's something about that sensuous intimacy of uh, of, a French kiss with your eyes open that that there's nothing else like that. And, And I would say really... Seek to up the sensuality of your lovemaking. Take your time. What does it feel like with your hand on your wife's back? And then as you go lower in her legs and, and, and just take your time to experience it. It's exciting when you get to what we would often call the main event when you're actually inside your wife, but make, but the experience to get there and afterward can be just as delicious, and especially when you've been making love for a long time. My wife and I have been married 38 years. It, it really does broaden the experience. When I was a young husband, that's kind of when I thought about sex. It was, okay, get ready so that we can do the real thing. And I realized, no, the getting ready isn't getting ready. It's part of the experience. Sit back, enjoy it, make it last. And, and now now it's, it's a full-blown experience, not just a few minutes of athletic action. Right. So how often do you and your wife have sex? I'm kidding. <laughs> Gary, Gary, don't do that. Don't answer that question. You'll get me in trouble and you'll get you in trouble. Don't worry, guys. He'll tell me off air. But um, one thing that's kind of an undercurrent of everything you're talking about is trust. And you yes. obviously talk about that in this book. Uh, you talk quite a bit about it actually in just relational intimacy being based on trust. You know, trust built by honesty. But <clears throat> what about I'm trying to think the best way to word this. What about if you're being too honest? So I I know a guy that was, uh, he had some infidelity, um, you know, and you guys can fill in the blanks however you want. And when he came clean, so he had kind of a God moment where it's like, okay, I'm going to come clean. So he has this uh, road to Damascus moment and he comes home and then he just dumps it all over his wife, right? And so it makes him feel better because he's let loose of all this guilt he had and now she's having to deal with it. But Gary, he went into a, tremendous amount of detail. So he, he talked about people. He talked about positions. He talked about, you know, different types of women that she knew that he would masturbate thinking about of. And uh, some people would say the more, the better baby, give her all the details, gory details, draw her pictures, right? Like let's make it as, as explicit as possible. But I've seen the damage it's done to that relationship. And, you know, it's hard to know all the details, that type of, of a thing. But talk to me a little bit about the the honesty based on trust versus, you know, guys process things differently than women and, and vice versa. And so describing things in that level of detail can be absolutely just paralyzing for a yeah. woman. And it's something that's hard for them to forget. Yeah. Right. And I know that this couple, like when one of the women would be around that he admitted to masturbating about, oh, oh, boy fireworks. Like if if everybody knew what was going on, uh, in the undercurrent of what was going on in the room, everybody would have left the room screaming. So talk to me a little bit about that because I know guys struggle with just how honest do I, do I have to be? Yeah. I'm so glad you're going here, Kyle. I mean, you really, you're really good at this. You you really are serving your listeners well, because a lot of people won't, won't go there. Hmm. Let, Let me give a layered answer to this. The ultimate goal is honesty with my spouse. You cannot be intimate with a woman you're lying to. Mm-hmm. 
If you're afraid of being found out, you're putting up walls of defense and you don't know when to take them down. And I've talked to so many wives where they said, Gary, I know something is going on, but he just won't let me in. And their fear of what might be going on might be worse than what's actually going on. And it's really creating a problem in the marriage. So the end goal is to live a life without secrets and without dishonesty. But getting there needs to be wise. This guy you're talking about betrayed his wife, and then he traumatized his wife. And I think you nailed it. It made him feel better, and it made her feel immeasurably worse. We have to realize if, if you've hurt your wife, the way it has to be shared, it almost always should be done in a clinical situation. In fact, there, there are two couples in the book where there was betrayal, um, I talked to another guy who had a sex addiction. What all the counselors said, and, and I've seen some counselors say this, if you've, for instance, been looking at porn, which I just want guys to know if you're doing that, about 35% of wives who find out literally have PTSD. There is traumatic stress legitimately, clinically clar- um, diagnosed. That It doesn't seem like a big deal to us. We're guys. We don't think it's personal. It is to a lot of wives. But that's why they'll often say, we urge husbands not to confess until they've had not six months of sobriety. Now, they're assuming the guy isn't using that to keep offending. He's in a group. He's in a 12-step group. No guy ever gets out of this alone. He's, he's working the steps. He's talking to people. He's being held accountable. But the reason they say that, if it's going to be so traumatizing to the wife, You don't want to confess and then do it again and it feels like another offense or whatnot. If you've got six months of sobriety and then with the help of a counselor who can care for your wife as she hears it, then you can share those details. But you've got to do it very gently and carefully and you don't know how. (laughs) Frankly, Mm -hmm. um, that's what a counselor is for, a counselor that can help the couple work through this. So I I agree. I think eventually confessions need to be made, not to the extent that you're talking about. Going into positions or this is a woman I masturbated to, I mean, I I, I don't think those things are helpful to be shared. Um, But I do think you're going to have to come clean to some extent, but that's usually best done in a counselor's office. You meeting with the counselor first, explaining what's going on, letting the counselor dictate, okay, here's the timing. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's when, here's why, here's the way to go about it. It's just going to be much easier because if you don't do this well, it may become as big an assault on your marriage as your initial betrayal. And now you've got two big problems to overcome and that that can be a lot. So um, it, it's like giving your wife the one, two, you know, it's the first hit that stuns her. Obviously, I'm speaking metaphorically. You never want to hit your wife. But, right. but I'm just talking to guys that do MMA. And then it's the uppercut that you're stunned and then boom, you're out. That's what you're doing to your wife with a one-two if I've been unfaithful. And then you do it in an insensitive way. It's not a wise thing to do. It's a, think- it's a harmful thing. It's an abusive thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember, uh, you know, if anybody's ever worked at like a church camp or you've worked at like a a men's retreat or something like that, you know, you had the tear filled, you know, Saturday night experience, but your spouse didn't. Right. Right. So you're coming home and you just can't wait to tell her the new about the new you and all the different things. She's been at home dealing with the kids and the dryer hasn't been working exactly properly. And, you know, you forgot to buy the milk and uh, and the cheese before you left. And so she had to go do it with the kids and blah, blah. Like she's not having the same, you know, amazing experience that you had. And then here you do, you, you come home and you do this cathartic thing for you. Uh, and so that's always, it, regardless of the circumstance, again, we're talking about a fairly extreme example of, you know, talking about, you know, infidelity and those types of things. But in any situation, your spouse can't be nearly as excited about the thing as you are. They just can't. And that's okay. Like the, they have to come towards you a little bit, but this is just one of those things. I wanted to kind of get that out there and get a professional opinion on that because I know a lot of guys really, really struggle with that. Uh, so we'll leave the we'll leave the books for now. I really appreciate you getting into all the books, even the ones I didn't ask you about. That's what happens when you write so many bestsellers, uh, you know, that you can just kind of weave in whichever one you want. But again, making your marriage a fortress, strengthening your marriage to withstand life storms. I want to ask you about something that's tangentially related to our discussion for today. Okay. And that's something that we talk about on this podcast often, and that's manhood in the church. 
or mm -hmm. masculinity in modern culture or those types of things. So really the whole reason why I started this ministry is to equip men to push back darkness, but specifically because the church is doing a really horrifically terrible job of equipping their men to do those things. Uh, the, the church has basically told men, we need you to act like women. And if you, if you don't act like women, we don't really have a place for you. And then they're shocked when all the volunteers are women, when husbands don't go to church with their wives and children, when their husbands are catechizing themselves on the golf course and not their children at home spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the church has a lot of blood on their hands when it comes to this issue, because to men, and Gary, you know this, I know this, everyone listening to this, know this knows this, is if you communicate to a man, you're not needed here, he will go somewhere else. Right. Whether that, that's a job or a relationship or a church, he will go where he feels like he can make a difference, even if he doesn't you know, have the emotional wherewithal to say it that way when asked the question. So I want to get your read because you spend a lot of time in churches, right? You, you write to a, an almost complete church-based audience. You've been in a lot of these churches that are not very man-friendly, but I'm sure you've seen examples of man-friendly churches. So give us your overall read of the current state of manhood in the church. Yeah. I, I think we have raised the most passive generation of males in the maybe in the history of civilization, and I think it's showing. And virtually every social issue that's going bad can be traced back to the silence of Adam. Men becoming passive, mm -hmm. men not stepping up, men not fulfilling their call and their roles. And but it's how we go about it, Kyle, to fix it. Um, and, and that's that's where we have to be wise. Before Sacred Marriage came out, I did a lot of collaborative books with famous people, including some professional athletes. And I learned something even about famous guys. If they don't think they can win, they're not going to play. Exactly. Some professional athletes won't take up golf because it's so hard. If they mm -hmm. can't excel, they're not going to play. And so when the church and the wife says, you don't know how to be a husband, you don't know how to be a dad, you don't know how to be a spiritual leader, that's a great way to get a husband to go golfing or hunting or <laughs> working out or whatnot. Cause he, he'll get, wow, you, you bench press that much or yeah, you got the biggest buck or yeah, you're, you know, you're a scratch golfer. Now. I mean, we'll get our ego stroked wherever we can. And so shaming men um, and, and it's where, where wives have to be careful. If you make your husband feel completely incompetent, that's a great way to make him look to be competent somewhere else. Now, this doesn't excuse the guy for not stepping up. Sure. Um, but I think the churches have to call men to do that. There is a difference. I think the biggest pushback I got on the book, Married Sex, is that I quoted neuroscientists who had the gall to say that men and women are different, oh. <laughs> that our brains oh, are different, that we process oh, stuff different. That I can't tell you how controversial that was. And some people said, oh, it's junk science. And I'm like, what, what are you talking Don't, hey, about? I read the one and two star reviews. I know exactly why <laughs> that's not as highly reviewed as the other books. <laughs> and and it was and it, it really came down. And I, I stand by that sentence. I had two neuroscientists look over the book before it came out. And I said, we got to pass and we got good. And, and then you had people who went on a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and calls it junk science. And it, it took, I'm like, fine. If you think, I, I, I love it when they say that there's no difference. I said, okay, show me the male Victoria's Secret stores. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, capitalism has showed that men are a little more visual. It's not that women aren't visual at all, but it's different for a man. And capitalism shows they have all of these stores where women are buying these outfits. Um, <laughs> I tell this story. A, a friend of mine, he went through some real financial challenge. We're going way off here. So you Let's can go. cut this out and we'll get back. No, 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 no. Let's keep But going. he's going through some financial challenges and um, it, life had just been tough. And his wife said, what do you want for Christmas? And he goes, you know what I'd really love? And she goes, what? He goes, you and a new cut of lingerie on Sunday morning, on Christmas morning and just let me look at you. She goes, I can do that. It's not too expensive. And, and he asked, how's that going? She said, think red. He was like a six-year-old boy. He goes, I can't remember the last time I looked forward to Christmas. I couldn't <laughs> wait, and she did. And then I'll ask the crowd, so imagine a wife, so they're in financial difficulties, and the husband goes, honey, what do you really want for Christmas? What are you really hoping for? And she goes, I know you can't spend all this. Like, I'd like you to go out and buy a thong. And on Christmas morning, I want you to come in. I want you to twirl around. And everybody laughs because that yeah. doesn't happen. Maybe one out of a million. Okay, maybe somebody, but maybe. We, we laugh. It, but yet we still want to say that men and women are the same. And I, look, I'm, I'm going to take the hits. I think they're different. And it's a message you're preaching. We've got to call men to be leaders. You know, it's, women want, they, they don't want male chauvinists. They don't want condescension. 
But the kind of leadership Paul talked about when you love your wife like Christ loves the church, it's an initiating love. It's putting her first love. It's serving her love. It's sacrificial love. That's the kind of thing where we our, our kids need it, our wives need it, and, and we've got to call them into it. I think one of the best books I've read on this, it's sadly out of print. It's a crime it's out of print. Maybe you can get a used copy. It's Larry Crabb's The Silence of Adam. Right. That's on our book list as well. And, he, and, and then you know he talks about how really that's where so much went wrong, where Adam has been silent instead of speaking up. And we live in a culture today telling men, shut up, unless you agree with us, of course. If, sure. let, let, yeah. let, what I'm saying, and if you want to say, yeah, I agree with that, then, then you can speak up. Otherwise, just don't say anything different. Don't take, and, and, and that's where I think we just have to say, all right, well, this is just where we are going to look at the world differently, and we've got to be man enough to take our hits. Uh, one, one, I worked with a famous politician, once was a presidential candidate, and I asked him, how do you handle it when they lie about you like this? Because I knew him, and I knew what the opponent was saying. Gary, you, you don't get into politics if you want people to lie. You know they're going to do it. I did a book with Evander Holyfield, you know, three-time heavyweight champion of the world, and I asked him, how come at the end you guys hug each other? I mean, you've been pummeling each other. And, then you, and he goes, Gary, if you don't want to get hit, you don't go in the ring. You don't take it personal. That's why you're there to fight. You're going to fight and you respect somebody. And, and I, I just want to say that to be guys in this world today, we can't be surprised that we're hit. I mean, we're, we're going to get hit. You're going to get slandered. You're going to get lied about. You're going to have your motives questioned. But ultimately, I live, Kyle, as a Christian to hear one person say, well done, my good and faithful servant. The God who created me as a man allow me to become a husband and a father and to have some influence in society. I want him to say, thank you for speaking up where you did. Thank you for putting my priorities first. Thank you for honoring the way I created you and the way I created the family and whatnot. And I, I really don't care, frankly, uh, what the world has to say about that. I just want to hear him say that. Yeah, we shouldn't really care what Bernie Sanders has to say about the issue. And a lot of guys get really, really concerned about what people are going to say on Facebook. And because they're spending too much time on Facebook, they, they assume that they can change people's opinions on social media, which I'm not sure that's happened in the history of social media uh, up to this point. But um, I wasn't going to go there, but it's your fault. You started it. Um, I do want to go into something else before, before we get to the wrap of the show. And because, you know, there's the male feminist uh, movement, which is kind of like a weird sexual dalliance. It's like these men are like, oh, I'm standing up for you. Will you have sex with me? That's kind of what this male feminist movement feels like. But obviously there's this, uh, the T of the LGBTQ revolution that churches, especially in this amalgamation of trying to act loving, just won't talk about it. Yeah. Or if they do talk about it, they're just like, yeah, totally fine. You were Gary last week, but now you're Regina this week. Sure, fine. Makes perfect sense. And and I've even talked to Christians that are well-meaning that have said, sure, I will use pronouns that do not align with the biological reality of the sex that God gave you so as to not hurt your feelings. And I could not disagree with that way of doing things more because telling someone that thinks they're a toaster, hey, let me go get some bread. I'm hungry. Open your mouth, please. That's not helping that person. Someone that thinks they're a furry, they think they're a dog, taking them on a walk and feeding them food on the floor does not help that person. That's not loving by any stretch of the imagination. You know what I mean? So again, that that's kind of somewhat tangentially re revolving around what we're talking about here in this modern you know, fight between male and female. And we've moved way pa past first wave feminism. We're getting into fourth wave feminism. And it's more than, oh, I just, I'm going to burn my bra and grow out my leg hair and I'm going to hate men. It's way more vindictive than that now. And most churches are caught flat-footed and instead of fighting, they're just being quiet about it. They're hoping it'll just brush right over them like wildfire, but it's not. It's stomach, it's stopping and it's consuming them. So what would you say to something like that? Because we're really getting into the hot water now. Like I was yeah. shocked when I looked at the reviews of of uh, married sex because it was like 3.7 or 3.8 out of 5. It's like, do people remember who Gary Thomas is? And it's yeah. just like, it was because you stepped on all of the rakes of society. So there you go. It's another bad setup for a question, but here, save me. Yeah. Just, again, I'm just saying as a believer, I worship the creator. I want to stress creator. The Bible begins and ends with God creating. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It ends with God creating the new heavens and the new earth. That's the bookends. That's who God is. And I just think as a creator, God knows what he's doing. He created a male and female. 
Together, we represent the image of God. Women matter, men matter, but he didn't make us the same. And so I think everything we say and do has to be in, in surrender to God's creational purpose, how he set things up. I think that's the best. And I think what has made sexual ethics such a morass is that we've moved it from a man and woman in marriage and then tried to say, okay, what are the rules now that we throw out the original rules? And and it just doesn't work. You make up your own rules on the spot. It's like Calvin and Hobbes. You know, you're changing. It doesn't make sense. And that's why things that weren't considered awful 10 years ago are considered terrible today and whatnot. If we would just go back to the Bible, how about being offended by the things that offended God 3,000 years ago? How about mm. going back things that offended God and the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago? Um, we don't have to try to make up new rules every 10 years. I, I had the privilege of studying under a brilliant man. He died just a couple of years ago. Dr. G.I. Packer wrote a classic called Knowing God. Um, and I, I, he read said something before he died that I just thought was fascinating in his book, Concise Theology, where he talked about our resurrected bodies. And I never hear Christians talking about this. God made us male and female, and then he promises we're going to have resurrected bodies. Hmm that are going to be in, in harmony with who we were on this earth as God created us. They won't be fallen bodies. They'll be glorified bodies and whatnot. But people will identify each other. There'll be a sense of who we were. And affirming who somebody is when it's not who God created them to be I mean, it has eternal complications in, mm -hmm. in whatnot. That, what, what I loved about it, what Packer said, is, you know what? In the end, God has the final say. God has a final say. I hear people say all the time, well, I wasn't made to be monogamous. Well, God did call you to be monogamous. Whether you felt like you were made this way or not, it's what you were called to be. It's what you're created to be. And if you're not, then there are going to be complications that result from that. And that's how I look at those issues. The farther we get away from God as creator, the more chaos that we unleash. And now the rules change every 10 minutes and I think you're going to create people who are bitter and frustrated and angry. And I see that boiling over. It's really scary um, because once once you invite chaos and anarchy, and we're getting really close to that, I mean, it's, it's a scary world. Well, I think uh, people are shocked, especially people in the woke crowd. In 2020, during George Floyd riot summer, they posted a black square on Instagram. But then the next year, the revolution came for them because of something they said 10 years ago or something, a joke that they laughed at or maybe retweeted 20 years ago is now catching back up to them or something like that. And we live in a world where there is no cosmic justice, where societally we don't believe in cosmic justice. So we have to fight tooth and nail for justice here, even though we don't even yes, have a concept a great for justice, it, yeah. right? But, but think about it. Like we don't even know without a moral law with which to differentiate between good and evil. We don't even know what justice is. Like, is it injustice? for a baby gazelle to be eaten by a fully grown lion? Is that an injustice or is that nature? Because those same people would say they're strict materialists and say that we're highly evolved chimps that used to be highly evolved, you know, fish that used to be highly evolved goo. And now it's like, oh, all of a sudden I can't take advantage of you. Like, think about it. why can't I hold someone down, rape them and steal their wallet? Why not? Like based on your worldview, why is that wrong? You can say that you don't like it, but you can't say that it's wrong. That goes to the moral dimension, which your worldview doesn't give us uh, much into that. But I don't want to get us so far off. I want to bring us back to the end here. So there's one last segment that I like to do, Gary, with, with certain people when we have time. There's a segment I do called, What Would You Say to Someone That Said? So what okay. I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what would you say to someone that said? And then I'm going to fill in the blank, but it's a lightning round. You have 30 seconds maximum to give me an answer to that. And it could be, you know, a one-star review that I've seen before. Or it could be a big topic. You got 30 seconds, meat and potatoes. That is it. So you up for it? I'll, I'll try. I don't think I'm the best at this. I like to reflect, but I'll give it a well, shot. I love making people as uncomfortable as possible. So we might as well do it with you, Succeeded. Gary. Let's get into the All first right. one here. All right. What would you say to someone that said, I want to have a better marriage, but I don't know where to start? Start with humility start with intention, start with purpose, move forward toward your spouse. All right. Next one here. What would you say to someone that said, I don't have time to work on my marriage? Then you're going to lose a lot of time on the effects of a bad marriage, the misery it brings you, the other problems you have. Um, the longer you put your marriage on the shelf, the worse it's going to get. 
and the harder it's going to be to get back. It's like getting out of shape. You know what? Mm -hmm. It's one thing if you miss a couple weeks because you were sick with COVID or something, but you miss a couple months, it's a whole different thing. You miss a couple years, you're starting over. See, you're doing just fine. You were all scared beforehand, but you're doing just fine. Let's keep this train moving. What would you say to someone that said, I don't like Gary Thomas's writing style? There are plenty of other authors to read. You can't like everybody. I, I have no problem with that. I happen to think uh, the Bee Gees were one of the greatest bands of all time and other people ridicule them. So, hey, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that God raises a church where many different voices speak in many different ways. And uh, there, there are plenty of other people to read. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Bee Gees thing at the end of the interview, not the beginning, because we would have <laughs> lost our entire audience. Just pew, <laughs> nosedive off the edge. But let's keep this going. Try not to embarrass yourself. What would you say to someone that said, Gary talks about sex too much? I've written 20 books. One of them is about sex. Okay. Then what would you say to someone that said, Gary doesn't talk about sex enough? <laughs> They're probably right. If I had more courage, I would have done it more and sooner. <laughs> well, you got a long career yet ahead of you. We got a few more here. What would you say to someone that said, Gary needs to write more books directed exclusively at men? I've begged my, beg, I, I've presented to my, every time I go through a new contract, I'm talking to my publisher about it. And here's the problem. I'm just being honest with your listeners. And I don't know that I ever have on a podcast. They just say, look, women buy books. They buy 70% of books. Publishers are terrified of publishing books directed toward men because they just think they won't move. John Eldridge's, of course, is, is an exception. Mm -hmm. But, you know, publishers can't make a living trying to catch lightning in a bottle. So I would say if guys want that, buy the books that are out there. Um, beg the publisher to bring the silence of Adam back out, um, by Larry Crabb, get a used copy of that. That's a great one to get started. But, but I agree. I, I think there is a place for it. It's just economically publishers are very wary of going down that route. Zondervan, Harper Collins, grow a backbone. All right. We need more good stuff. All right. Don't get mad at him. I'm the one that said it. All right. Two more left. What would you say to someone that said Gary has probably written enough books about marriage? Well, you know, I was starting to think that, which is why with Making Your Marriage a Fortress, it's really more of a journalist. I'm going to other people. I think wise couples that have gone through difficult times, they have a chapter in them. They might not have a book. They have a good chapter. Hmm. And that's what this book is. It's a series of chapters of other couples, their wisdom, their lessons. And I'm more like a journalist saying, here's what I've learned. Here's how I've been inspired. But yeah, I do think there's a point where I've seen this with other authors and I've really wanted to avoid where they write the same book 10 times. <laughs> they, they changed the title, but you know, it's pretty much the same stuff. And I certainly want to stay away from that. I may have mentioned one earlier in this podcast, who's my <laughs> least favorite of people that do that genre that I'm sure you've done a speaking gig with before that I shouldn't mention again. So I don't get you in trouble. I've already gotten you in enough trouble. Last question of the day, Gary, what would you say to someone that said, not even God could save my marriage? I, I believe that the God who raised people from, raised Jesus from the dead can raise a marriage from the dead. If there are two people who are repentant, open to the work and power of the Holy Spirit, open to the grace and forgiveness of Jesus, I've seen couples face every imaginable issue and come out the stronger for it. I do believe, Kyle, we have to be open that one person can torpedo a marriage. It might be the guy says, I, I want to, but my wife isn't there. And and sometimes you then you have to pray and wait for God to change her heart because I do think one person can make it impossible. But if you have two willing people surrendered to God, walking in grace, leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit, I've seen it happen. I've seen it. I know a couple, they were divorced for seven years and got back together and have a great marriage today. So uh, don't, now this is a cliche, but don't, you know, compare yourself with your problems, compare your problems with God. And then you have a whole different scenario. Well, I certainly appreciate all the ground you've let us cover today. I appreciate you being patient uh, with the timing and getting this booked and scheduled. But that is all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Kyle, you're a delight to talk to. I, I, yeah, I know why you've gotten such a following. Um, thank you for serving your people so well. Thank you for being a faithful steward of the influence and the corner of the world that God has given you. And I just pray you'll continue. I, I admire your courage, your forthrightness. Uh, we need more of that and younger men today. Well, if you write that men's book, you can obviously come back on here and talk about it. So Gary Thomas, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thank you, Kyle.
There you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed our time with Gary Thomas. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So the links I've got for you today, I've got a link to Gary's website, but I've also got four specific books. These are the books that we talked about in the episode, so you can go to Amazon and pick those up. Making Your Marriage a Fortress, Married Sex, Sacred Marriage, and Cherish. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at andonta.life. That's I-N-F-O at andonta.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Ties, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>